Happy Friday on today's episode of the John Campus Show podcast. Oops, did we say the name of our movie was Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1? We were kidding. They dropped the Part 1 from the title. What does that mean moving forward? Also, Indiana Jones and the Great Circle just dropped a trailer. Some idiotic controversy going on about it because the trailer looks great. Also, Percy Jackson, the numbers just came out and the debut actually beat MCU shows Secret Invasion and Loki Season 2. How big is that and how important are those numbers? Also, Dune Part 2 gets a staggering runtime and Vincent D'Onofrio explains why Marvel changed their minds about not having the new Daredevil be the same as the Netflix one to making it the same. That and a whole bunch more of the John Campus Show podcast starts right now. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth, the John Campbell Show podcast. Coming to you from right here in our quaint little studio, brought to you in part by our friends at Mint Mobile. I'm, of course, your host, John Campia, and it is an awesome honor and privilege, as it is every day, to have you, our international friends, gather around as we talk about our absolute favorite things in the world, movies and movie news, TV and streaming, and all sorts of good stuff. Not just giving you our opinions, but hopefully giving you some information and context so you guys can form your own well-informed opinions, whether they're the same or completely different than ours. Uh, joining me in studio today, we got Ray Ora. Hey, hey, happy Friday. Right beside him, we got Jonathan Voiko. Hello, everybody. The wonderful Chris Carr is here. Happy National Popcorn Day for those of you who celebrate. Ooh. Oh, I, well, I'm really more of a butter guy. Popcorn is just my it's butter just the delivery vessel. device. Yeah. But most importantly, you guys are here. Thank you so much for being here and making this show a part of your day. Here's how it's going to go. We're going to start off by going through those topics that I just listed off. Then the last part of the show, we're going to take your live comments and questions. We already asked our YouTube channel members to send in some topics, so we'll get to as many of those as we can a little bit later. But also, if you're watching live, and you got to be watching live, you guys can use the Super Chat feature and fire in a thought, comment, opinion, whatever. And as long as it's appropriate to be used on our show, we'll address that near the end of the show. All right, guys. With that down... Let's get on to things here, shall we? We're going to start off with this. Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1, I, I thought was a very fun movie. Not my favorite of the Mission Impossible films by any stretch, but I thought it was pretty damn good. Really long title, though. Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. Well, the movie is now coming to Paramount Plus with a little bit of an adjustment in the title. And that is the topic of today's Mint Mobile Hotline question of the day. Listen, guys, if you've got a question for our show and you'd like to hear your voice on our show, go ahead and call our Mint Mobile hotline anytime, 24-7 at 951-268-4259. And today's question is specifically about Mission Impossible. Check it out. Hey, John, this is Brian. I just read in on Deadline that Paramount Plus has set the streaming premiere date for Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. However, they have dropped Part 1 from the title. Uh, do you think that they are changing the title of Part 2? And also, do you think that it's because they feel the Part 1 is what scared people off from watching the first film? Thanks, and stay healthy. All right, thanks a lot for sending that in, Brian. And uh, yeah, for those of you who missed it, Deadline did indeed report. This comes to us from Deadline. They wrote the following. Paramount Pictures, Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning. Notice how it just stops at that? Dead Reckoning. We'll begin streaming on Paramount Plus on Thursday, January 25th, so next week, uh, in the U.S. and Canada. The film, which has a slight title tweak with Part 1 being dropped, will premiere in additional Paramount Plus international markets beginning in February of 2024. All right, let's touch on this. Now, somebody correct me if I'm wrong here. You're wrong. <laughs> so quick. <laughs> but um, all you need is kill Edge of Tomorrow. Yes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Was that a Paramount release? Yeah, I believe okay. so. So Paramount has a little bit of a history of not being real committal to what they title Tom Cruise movies. Because they had this great source material, Live, Die, Repeat, or uh, All You Need Is Kill. Very unique title, stands out, should have just kept it. Instead... They gave the movie a daytime soap opera title with Edge of Tomorrow. Excuse me, John. It's uh, Warner Brothers. I'm sorry. Uh, it, was Warner, it was Warner I'm Brothers. Sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But I'm sorry. thank you for, for looking that up. Yeah. So this seems to happen to Tom Cruise movies. And so they then the DVD came out and they changed the title on the DVD cover at first to Live, Die, Repeat, which was a tagline of the movie previously. And then later... They changed it back to Edge of Tomorrow and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, 
I remember being at CinemaCon two years ago and they revealed the title for the new Mission Impossible. And I remember thinking, that's a long title. I mean, really, at the end of the day, only six words, but Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part One. That's a mouthful. And you ask a very interesting question. Does Paramount think that the title and having part one is what made the film underperform? I mean, it still did do bad. Ray, if you can look up the total yeah, sure. box office for Dead Reckoning Part One. I mean, it still made money, but it, it kind of underperformed for the franchise. Was it because it said part one? What, 567 million. $567 million. All right, so crack the half a billion mark, whatever. Is down from some of the previous installments. Remember, no Mission Impossible film ever made a billion, so it's not like it was way underperforming. I actually think the part one tag probably did turn some people off. I, I don't know. That's It's not the reason the film made 560 instead of 760. But just putting part one in the title, you're kind of telling the audience, you're going to come to our movie. Whether you like it or not. But you're, whether you like it, but you're <laughs> not going to get the full movie. Yeah. You're not getting the full story. It's kind of what they're telling the audience. Again, do I think that was a major factor in it only making 560 million? No, but, but did it turn some people off? Maybe. And so as far as that part of your question where you're asking, do I think this will affect the title of the second one? Yeah, I don't think the next one's going to be titled Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 2. It'll be called, be called Mission Impossible AI Look Out or something like that. Like it's, It reminds me of whenever a boxing match that everyone's looking forward to, whatever, ends in a draw. Like when you, when it's like going to a movie knowing there's no conclusion was when, when, because this was my first Mission Impossible movie that I've ever, ever seen. I even asked you guys before we went to go see it. Do I really need to go watch this since there's a second one coming out? And I just want to watch it all at one time or and things like that. So it did kind of bother me that and the reason why Spider-Verse probably changed their name, too. It'll, it'll help the next movie for sure, I think, not having part two attached to it. Yeah, and, yeah, I, I think so, too. Now, I still see some people in, in the like There's still people out there who believe this total myth. Well, the thing that killed Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning was that it opened the week before Barbenheimer. Really? Because Barbie and Oppenheimer opened on the exact same week and there was plenty of money to go around. Yeah, I, I think it's a derivative of that. I don't think that's the correct thing. What I do think had a small, just a small impact for me, at least, and some others that I talked to is that it only ran in IMAX for a week and people wanted to specifically see Dead Reckoning in IMAX and then it was gone. I think some people did. That's but a small. Again, at the same time, if it was, here's the thing. If it was the Barbenheimer thing, then that would have meant it would have had a huge opening weekend. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Right? right? And then just died. Yeah. But right. it didn't. No. It right. didn't have a massive opening weekend, right? So anyway, there's that. So you know what? Normally I'm like, hey, when you make a choice, just stick with it. You called it, you know, Edge of Tomorrow, just stick with it. You called the Mission Impossible Dead One, stick with it. But I actually think in this circumstance, I think it's probably a good move. Sure. Um, and I I think therefore they will name the next film, something different. Anyway, Chris, you heard about this. What do you think of it? I think they absolutely are going to name this other movie something else. And this all makes sense. This movie didn't perform as well as they thought it was going to, as much as they wanted it to. And also, part two has been pushed back by yet another year. Yeah. So when you have your part one and your part two spread so far across, mm -hmm. you know, it's not a club sandwich. I don't want a whole bunch of time and layers in between there. I want the movies close together if it's part one and part two. So... The original timeline was June 28th of 2024. It's now May 23rd of 2025. That's quite a bit of distance from the original one coming out. Not the original Strikes one, will the do latest that. one. Absolutely, yeah. they will. But for your audience too, and especially your average movie going audience who wasn't keeping up with the strikes, they're kind of going to go, well, where's that movie part one? When did that come out? Especially if they didn't see it the first time around, you're yeah. going to lose interest. Yeah. You got to have a new title in here. And if Dead Reckoning was the one that didn't get butts in seats, Dead Reckoning Part 2, Electric Boogaloo, isn't going to do much either. That, actually, that's a really good point. You know, oh, you Tell almost want to disassociate from the first one a yeah, little bit. Exactly. Yeah. Get a new name. I know I am looking forward to watching it again, though, when it hits uh, Paramount+. Plus. I it's did enjoy one. the film. I like this one a lot. Yeah, it's I had a good fun. time with it. And Hilly Atwell, oh my gosh, she's so good in this. And uh, Nebula's name, uh, Palm Clemente. I yeah. oh, loved her yeah. in this. Yeah, yeah. I was so glad at the end of the movie when they say, oh, she survived. I'm like, ah, yes. It's amazing seeing her do more than Mantis because that was my first uh, view of Palm. And man, she's 
tremendous. Yeah, she's Oof. she's awesome. All right, guys, with that down. Let's move on to this, shall we? Uh, sticking in the realm of big movie franchises, there's a video game coming out called Indiana Jones. And I got to admit, I didn't really like the title. The Great Circle. Yes. I expect Mufasa to talk about, come out and give a lecture on something. Indy, everything the light touches <laughs> is will our be kingdom. Yours. Is our be kingdom of the crystal skull. Everything the light touches belongs in a museum. <laughs> <laughs> so they got this, this game coming out. I didn't really like the title, but the trailer dropped today. And the trailer made me do a complete 180 on the title. Because, like, the trailer dropped, and when he, he explains all these, like, locations, all these monuments, whatever, when you chart them out, they form a complete circle around the globe. I'm like, oh, okay. Now the title makes sense to me. Now I like the title. Okay, let's talk about the trailer for a second. I thought this trailer was wonderful. I thought it was great. You know Why? It did something, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, and to a degree, uh, Box of Depends. What was the name of the Dial last? of Destiny. Dial of Destiny. What Box. they did not actually manage to do, which was to really feel like an Indiana Jones adventure. Right? Like, and don't get me wrong. I liked Dial of Destiny. I thought, I mean, I didn't think it was anywhere near as good as the original three. I thought it was a step up from Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. I, I had an okay time with it. But this trailer felt like an Indiana Jones story. Right, it had the charm and the wit of it. the The music hits were all just right. The whole idea about again, he's hunting and researching artifacts that aren't <laughs> alien, which is key and important to me. And I truly thought this trailer was delightful. Two things. One, I'm kind of bummed out about. One, I really think is something that some people are making a big deal out of that they absolutely should not be making a big deal out of. Number one, I was very bummed out to find out this was an Xbox exclusive. I guess other people knew that already. No, I, I was very sad about yeah, that. Because Bethesda is owned by Microsoft. Yeah, so. which I, makes sense. But sure. sure. I want it on the PS5. Console. Still bums That's me true, out. You, can stream you don't it. need an Xbox console. It's yeah. uh, on Game Pass day one. Yeah, but you I can, don't want to play it. it on a PC. I want to try it on my PlayStation. You, you could play it on uh, just your internet. Uh, yeah, on your, I whatever, still, on your I, I want to play it on my, on my Ray, PlayStation. Ray, I spent so I'm much money. I'm out about I spent so much money. I'm just saying I'm bummed out about it, right? That's fine. It's fine. Okay, it's fine. <laughs> you know what? I'm sure Xbox users wish, you know, some games on PlayStation. Oh, we're sure. We're we, sure. We want Yeah, but a that's lot of your games. fault yeah. for being a second-class citizen. Oh, whoa. So I have Whoa. Whoa. I have Whoa. Hey, hey, hey. I, I like have to dual thank everyone. Thank Shots you very much. Fired. I'd like to thank That's everyone nice. who's uh, well supported me throughout my journey here <laughs> at uh, the John Campy. Triple Campus. citizenship because I have switched. So. Um, okay, but here's the part that, the, like, I just see angry people online over something really ridiculously trivial. The game's going to be a first person game. No! No! <laughs> like, that's all I hear. I'm like, <laughs> why wouldn't you want to be indie? Well, you here's are. the thing. That's, I, your, that's his yeah, arm. Yeah, I'm saying, like, why would you be mad about it? Yeah. I, I get it to a degree I'm because, like, the argument <clears throat> that gets made, and, and I think there's some validity to it, the argument that gets made that. is that, hey, you're playing Indiana Jones. It would be kind of cool to see Indiana Jones as you're playing the game. Like, a little more uncharted. Mm -hmm. Stop him to go third person, right? Okay, you know, you know what? If they had called me and asked for my opinion, I would have said, uh, go third person. I, I think that's what I would have done. He's but in all the cutscenes. Some of the best games I've ever played are first person games. And clearly, you're going to see a lot of yeah. indie in this game. It's not like you're never going to see it. Like, clear, just watch the trailer. You're going to see a lot of indie. And again, some of my favorite games I've ever played are first person games. So, you know what? Would I have gone third person? Sure. Is it worth a little discussion? Sure. Is it worth getting uh, worked up people about? People are like, let's find this one Look, thing to harp on and just never let go of it. Well, listen, Forbes itself, like the, the, the outcry was so great. Forbes even did an article on this this morning. Oh, my. A anyway, this is what they wrote. They said oh the following. Boy. Xbox showed off a number of games that its developer direct showcase on Thursday, the highlight of which was Machine Games' upcoming Indiana Jones game, Indiana Jones and the Great Circle, a long-term project from Todd Howard now becoming a reality under Microsoft ownership. 
Machine Games, maker of the recent Wolfenstein games, has opted to make its Indiana Jones game first person rather than third person. And this has now sparked a debate, a debate whether or not it was the right call. But as you might expect, I think they're very right about this. As you might expect, a good amount of this is bad faith console warring. I, I think they're they're right about that. I, I also think there's just a lot of people like to complain. And listen, I also think there's some legitimate people out there who just thoroughly prefer third person to first person. But there's also a lot of people out there who thoroughly enjoy first person as opposed to third person. It just depends on the game because it, like an exactly. Assassin's, Assassin's Creed, you need to be third person because you're parkouring everywhere. You've got like Batman, it makes sense too, right? Those yeah. games. But like Skyrim, which I'm pretty sure this is based on Skyrim's build, is first person. You were saying that earlier. And yeah. whenever I've tried... Okay, here's another point. is Whenever I've tried to click out... Because with Skyrim, you can click out into third person. Yeah. It is sketchy to play. Mm -hmm. it, but in first person, they could have a button where you hit, like, like if your PC space bar, if you're whatever on Xbox, you can pop out into third person. We don't know that yet. We haven't seen everything. Listen, if I'm organizing my house in Skyrim, I'm doing it in first person. Yeah. That bookshelf <laughs> isn't going to fill itself. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. I, I, again, though, I, I think it's... Would I have preferred third person? Sure. Is it a big deal? Absolutely not. As it's all about, does will first person better suit the gameplay they're making? Machine Games has a lot of experience making first person games. So it, it just kind of makes sense. We'll see how the game... Anyway, Chris, you heard about this. First of all, did you see the trailer? What did you think about the trailer? The trailer? I mean, I got bummed out just because of the, oh man, Xbox, no, I need to get an Xbox. And I just paid off my PlayStation 5. Uh, <laughs> what a coup in the car Pete's household. Woohoo! <laughs> big day for us. But this game looks gorge. It looks wonderful. I'm yeah. really excited about it. The plot looks fantastic. And Troy Baker, I mean, come on. Did a really good job. The range of Troy Baker is just astounding. Once again, doing full cap, uh, motion capture performance, full performance capture. All of that looks Really, great. really doing and wonderful work. Great. Sounds so much like Indy, too. He does a wonderful job there. To go from playing Joel to this, to his work as the Joker and everything, he is such a tremendous actor. Um, we also have uh, Alessandra, I can't remember her last name, the oh, wonderful actress who played opposite uh, Nicolas Cage and Pedro Pascal in uh, The Unbearable, unbearable weight. weight of Massive Talent? Yes, yeah. yeah. She's the voice of Gina in this, your female protagonist who's t uh, being paired up with Indy. I'm really excited about it. I think it's going to be fun. I mean, here's I a, sad, a good here's sad thing. Good mm -hmm. thing and sad thing. It looks better than Crystal Skull and Dial of Destiny. Listen, all right, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to... I'm gonna win points with my husband and I'm gonna alienate so alienate so many of you. I like Kingdom of Crystal Skull more than I liked Dial of Destiny. Oh, really? It. Dial it, of Destiny I thought was so bad. Is it Sharon Hart? <laughs> I was so bummed about that movie. And I had such high hopes as an indie fan, but <laughs> oof. There's a parts in this trailer that are like I saw they did well. Like when Indy walks up to like one of the stones and it pushes it in or something, yeah. and it pans out and you see him. And you see the puzzle start. Yeah, I heard there are going to be times when it does pull that, back into third yeah, person. Yeah, I mean, like yeah. you get that. We haven't had an Indiana Jones game since 2009. And when we they release a trailer for a beautiful game, the whip the whip play. The whip stuff look great. The whip play in this is going to be fantastic. If, if you could use the environment. And in my house, whip play usually means something <laughs> oh, God, completely different. Oh, God, right? blah, blah, <laughs> oh, blah, 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 right? blah. Well, <laughs> we'll see you guys blah, later. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> okay. And also, like... <laughs> When I see this first person, I have this dream that they might have multiplayer here. They probably don't, but everyone, I'm thinking GoldenEye, the next GoldenEye, Indiana Jones yeah. style would be super uh, good. I mean, this looks beautiful. I, I don't see what to, there's complaint about. Even if it was a PS5 game, if it's a PlayStation exclusive, I would feel the same way. I don't care. It's one love here, baby. <clears throat> all right, guys. <laughs> Even though I'm all Xbox. <laughs> <laughs> With that down... Let's move on to this, shall we? You know, uh, with a lot of the crap talk, deservedly so, that goes on around uh, some of the shows on Disney+, Plus. although they put out a couple things that I really, really love, uh, out of nowhere came this little Percy Jackson show that I'll admit I didn't have much excitement for, other than the fact that they cast Scoble Walker in there. And I, I, I didn't have high hopes for it. I didn't think it was going to be all that great. I thought it will probably be kind of a cute little thing. I have been totally delighted by this show. It's not the best thing on Disney Plus, but I have been completely charmed by it. I, I think it's really good. I think the young cast has been wonderful. I think it's been a great version of the the movies that I saw. I mean, obviously, it's been stretched out a little bit more. I've been really enjoying it, and I can't wait to see where it goes from here. Well, apparently, this thing was bigger than 
I kind of thought it was. Because new numbers have just come out that have shown that the debut of Walker Scoble in Percy Jackson actually beat the debut of some MCU shows, some recent MCU shows. This comes to us from comicbook.com who wrote the following. Percy Jackson's debut on Disney Plus surpassed two recent Marvel Studio releases on the platform. This equates to around 7.5 million complete runs, a.k.a. views, in the U.S. Over its first six days, Percy Jackson earned 13.3 million views worldwide, which is around 505 million minutes of viewership. These numbers are greater than Secret Invasion, 461 million minutes, and the second season of Loki, 446 million minutes, when it comes to total view time. All right, so there's a couple interesting things here. Number one... The fact that this show is actually better, and I'll say it, this Percy Jackson show is better than Secret Invasion was, and it's better than Loki Season 2. I like Loki Season 2, by the way. If you guys watch my show, you know I liked Loki Season 2. I liked it better than Season 1. But I think Percy Jackson's been better than Loki. But that doesn't have anything to do with it because you had to have watched a few episodes to know it's better. It debuted bigger. Before word of mouth got to get out and, and let everybody know this show is actually really charming and quite delightful and wonderful to watch, it debuted big, bigger. So here's my question. Is this more of a statement of the downward slide of the MCU or is this more of a statement of how people like me underestimated the popularity and enthusiasm the audience base out there had for Percy Jackson? Or is it a mixture of the two? And either way, I cannot be more thrilled for the team behind Percy Jackson that they're enjoying this kind of success because truly, it, it, they have made a really good quality piece of entertainment that I've been enjoying watching. Anyway, Chris, you heard these numbers. I know you're not all caught up on Percy Jackson. No, I'm excited yet. to go. But uh, how do you interpret these numbers? What parts of this are standing out to you? Honestly, it makes sense to me just because quality but gets more views that's really the secret sauce here there's not some special formula it's hey is the show good awesome people are going to tune in because things like secret invasion had the potential to be so great right they had the potential to be good but word of mouth gets out so if you haven't caught up you're not going to tune in and anyway and percy jackson had so much going for it like marvel like star wars properties huge following here 180 million copies of this book have sold. It's been translated into about 40 different languages. People love these books. So to have the actual creator too, uh, Rick Riordan, I believe is his name, right? Riordan. Uh, Riordan, thank you so much. Uh, my brother read the books, I did not. He's behind this, he helped with the casting. He, they made sure they had that almost kind of Harry Potter trio chemistry with go. those kids. Okay. You know, this appeals to such a wide audience too, because if you're like me and you didn't read the books, it's a quality show that has some really fun takes on mythology with some great, great scenes with Edge showing up. Oh my gosh, I was so happy my boy was did well. I was oh, good seeing yeah, Edge in that. He did so great. Aries. We were talking about this before the show started, you guys. Every moment Edge is on screen, you can tell he's having the best time. He is so happy and playing into that world with such authenticity for who he's playing and everything. I don't yeah. want to spoil anything if you haven't caught up, but he's wonderful in it. All the other kind of cameos and guest stars in it, so well done. If you did like the books, my understanding is that this is a really great kind of imagining of this kind of series and everything. They're doing really great work with the pacing of it. Um, man, it's just, it's quality television that I think also you can sit down as a whole family and yeah, watch and really enjoy it. Too. Yeah, like, let's not forget, this, a lot of people get Disney Plus because of their kids or their children. Yeah, yeah. And this show, if there was a show like this, I would have been on this from day one. I mean, uh, this says a lot for the Harry Potter series coming out. Watch out. Look at those numbers. Those numbers are going to be huge, too. If they're still making it, are they still making the Harry Potter That's still supposed series? to happen. Oh, yeah. There's, yeah, yeah that's going to be yeah. big, too. I mean, th this this type of stuff never gets old. You know, I, I saw somebody in the live chat say, well, you, you can't compare because they're two completely, they're going for two completely different audiences, like the Marvel stuff. No, they're not. Not really. I mean, are they exact the same? No. But they're, they're both shows that appeal. So like, listen, at the end of the day, Percy Jackson is an is a uh, fantasy film, right? It's it's not far. You're going to get a lot of crossover of MCU viewership that would be appealed to by stuff like this. I, I'm one of them. Yeah. Like, I, I'm interested in this. So it's uh, good on them. Good on them. But they're having this kind of success, and I hope they're able to finish this season strong because I'll be very disappointed if they crap the bed with the ending. All right. 
Guys, we still got to talk about Dune getting an epic runtime, the longest of Denis Villeneuve's career. Also, Vincent D'Onofrio decided he was going to explain why Marvel just changed their mind about not having the Netflix stuff as canon to now having it as canon. Uh, but before we get to that, we're going to take a moment and thank a couple of sponsors of today's episode of the John Campbell Show podcast, our friends at BetterHelp and Mando. Guys, we want to thank a sponsor of today's video, better help guys it's a brand new year and a lot of people are making new year's resolutions you know things they want to change about themselves but i've always believed that it's also equally as important to identify the things we're doing well and building on those and therapy helps you find your strengths so you can ditch the extreme resolutions and make changes that really stick i've always believed that nothing impacts our daily performance in our jobs our hobbies our relationships like our mental health and i've also said for a long time that it's about time that we stop just putting emphasis on improving our physical health by getting out to the gym, but also by putting emphasis on improving our mental health as well. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. All you got to do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. So guys, celebrate the progress you've already made. Visit betterhelp.com slash campia today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash Campia. Guys, we want to thank a sponsor of today's video, Mando. Mando whole body deodorant is the all-terrain vehicle of deodorants. It goes everywhere. Put it in your pits, package, feet, back, knees, everywhere. Because something all of us guys know is that body odor happens all over your body. So why are we just putting on deodorant in our pits? Mando is powerful. It's clinically proven to control odor everywhere, but gentle enough to use in your sensitive bits too. Just try Mando's cologne quality scents and smell the difference from your underarms to your underballs. And a special offer for John Campia's show audience members, new customers get $5 off a starter pack with our exclusive code and link. Use the code CAMPIA at shopmando.com. S-H-O-P-M-A-N-D-O.com. I have been loving using Mando because it goes on smooth, it feels clean, and it leaves me smelling great. Mando is created by a doctor who saw firsthand how normal BO was being misdiagnosed and mistreated. And it is clinically proven to block odor all day and control odor for up to 72 hours. And Mando's starter pack is perfect for new customers. It comes with a solid stick deodorant, cream tube deodorant, two Two free products of your choice like mint body wash and deodorant wipes and free shipping. And again, as a special offer for John Campia Show audience members, new customers get $5 off a Mando starter pack with the code CAMPIA at shopmando.com. And thank you to our friends at BetterHelp and Mando for sponsoring today's episode of the John Campia Show podcast. All right, guys, with that down, let's move on to this, shall we? If it wasn't for a little film called Deadpool 3 that's coming out this year, easily my number one most anticipated film of this year would be Dune 2. Um, the first Dune was a remarkable achievement. I remember Rob and I were talking about the first Dune. And like, if you read the first books, like it's hard to imagine how anybody could have made that first Dune better. I, I don't know that it can be made better than the what Denis Villeneuve did. It went on to win six Academy Awards, more than any other film that year that the first one came out. Now, of course, it got bumped out of its late 2023, which is good news for all the other Oscar contenders, because it means they don't have to compete against Dune 2, uh, because of the actor strike that was going on, and they have a lot of big stars in this movie that weren't going to be able to go out to promote it, so they bumped it into 2024. And it's coming up soon, and I'm very excited for this. I know Ray's excited for it, too. Yeah, bro. But he might be a little less excited now that the runtime yeah. for Dune Part 2 has now come out. This comes to us from the folks over at CBR who wrote the following. Digital Spy reports that per the Irish Film Classification Office, Dune Part 2 will run for a total of 165 minutes or 2 hours and 45 minutes, 15 minutes shy of 3 hours. This makes it longer than director Denis Villeneuve's first Dune film, which clocked in at 155 minutes, as well as David Lynch's original Dune adaptation at 137 minutes. It is also now Denis Villeneuve's longest movie to date. So, a couple of ramifications come of something this long. 
Because now we're not said. just talking about long. We're when you you start kissing up to three hours, you're really you're in a new category of long, right? <clears throat> so, uh, the the standard challenges that will come with really long films, you know, how many extra screenings can you get in, and and you know all that kind of stuff. And some people may validly ask, well, wait a minute. If somebody was able to make one movie in two hours and 17 minutes, why is this being broken into two films with a grand total of probably five or six hours? Well, because Dune is a very thick book. It's thick. And there's a lot of story in there. Thick. To go over. Um, but, but I will tell you this. I've always said this, longer doesn't equal better, shorter doesn't equal better. Every movie has its own unique runtime. I thought the runtime of the first Dune was perfect for it. It didn't, I didn't feel like anything was rushed and I never felt like it dragged. So I'm like, to me, perfect. If Denis Villeneuve was bringing that same notion to here, because now we're getting into all the payoff, right? The first movie was about setting up the conflict. The second movie is now the resolutions of those conflicts. And if he can achieve the same pacing that he had in the first film, no. No. then this is, then I'm fine with it. Now, again, we may watch the movie and I may go, yeah, kind of like I did with, listen, I love Killers of the Flower Moon. It could have been 20 minutes shorter. I love The Irishman. It easily could have been a full 30 minutes shorter. At least. Yeah, at <laughs> least a full 30 <laughs> minutes shorter. Chris. And I like The Irishman. Oof, my goof. I, I like that movie. Cinema. And I'm saying I think it could have been easily 30 minutes shorter. But- and so we won't know for sure until we watch this, but seeing it's only 10 minutes longer than the first one. And I thought the pacing of the first one was great. I'm all, I'm all fine with this. It is interesting that it does mark Denis Villeneuve's longest film that he's ever done. And it does, you know, I had an interesting conversation with a Hollywood guy yesterday. Oh, a Hollywood guy. A Hollywood guy. All right. And the Hollywood guy was bringing up an interesting thing. It's like, it feels like one of the great things about the the medium of film is that it forces a filmmaker to utilize every ounce of creativity, ingenuity, and storytelling skill to tell your full story in a finite window of time. And the Hollywood guy was basically saying, it feels like some of the bigger directors these days feel like that limitation shouldn't apply to them. And they're making these movies longer and longer and longer and longer, which is ultimately kind of sacrificing a little bit. I don't know that I fully agree. I think there are some situations. Again, I didn't think the Irishman needed to be 17 and a half hours long. At least that's what it felt like. Um, but sometimes some movies do require that runtime. So again, we'll see how it works out with Dune. Um, it's only 10 minutes longer, Chris, than the first Dune was. And I thought the pacing of the first Dune was good. Now, you're one of the few people I know that did not love the first Dune film. No. Right? So I you didn't. hear this. What does that say to you? Ten more minutes of boring tremors? Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. I'm sorry. Y'all. I did not enjoy that first movie. Everyone has told me, though, that where we left off is where all the action and everything starts It's where starts everything happening. really starts. Yeah. So I can understand this extra runtime on here with that in mind. Supposedly, so much is going to happen here. We're going to have so many different characters introduced. I, I'm in love with who's all cast in this. Yeah. Like in the first film, they didn't even introduce us to the emperor. Yeah. They didn't even introduce us to the princess. They didn't even, like, there's a whole bunch of characters we haven't even met yet in the first film. Exactly. So I can understand the extra padding in here for time. I'm hoping that I am more intrigued and more into this film than I was for its first one. But man, and I and I know I'm in the minority, you guys. Not everything is made for me. Not everything is made for you. We're all going to have different opinions on it. Everyone keeps telling me, too, the pacing of that first film is very on par with the book. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, as, as a Lord of the Rings apologist, I'm like, no, you need to take all those paragraphs to describe grass. Get out of here. We've <laughs> got to take that time. So I can understand it if you love this book that this book, uh, this movie really, really works for you. So I'm going to go into it with an open mind and everything. But, man, I... I'm just not thrilled. This isn't one of my most anticipated films like you guys, but hopefully it'll turn it around for me. Ray, last night you and I went to go see ISS. Go see it, everyone. A movie I, I quite enjoyed, it. to be honest. I thought it was really quite good. Yeah. At a spanking, what was it? 135. One th at a spanking 135, 95 minutes. No, no, it was, it, it was an hour 35, not 135 yeah, yeah, minutes. Yeah. 95 minutes. This one's almost double. No, no, no. How are you feeling about this? The, the, this is a big problem because I, the first Dune, 
Though I ended up, I did like the movie after I finished it. It took, it took you a while me to finish four it. or That's five sittings to finish it. Typically, how people feel about movies they like. It took it's me, after they. No, 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 no. It's it's it's, it's no because it took me four or five <laughs> yeah. sittings no, to, fin it. to finish it. So like, um, I'm not sure how this is. If it goes, if it goes straight to the action, I, I might be there. But you know what? I I I got through Oppenheimer. I was I was. You were enthralled I with was Oppenheimer. Like, that that was a some, three hour runtime. Yeah. I was like during Oppenheimer, I was like, "This is some crazy stuff that happened back then." <laughs> and just keep yeah. telling yourself that this Dune movie is 15 minutes shorter than Oppenheimer. You know, so it, it, it all way. depends. I, like, I guess the pacing in the first one didn't work for me. If I had, if I fell asleep, but also I watched it in the comfort of my own home on HBO right. Max, <laughs> so that that probably had to deal with it. Probably my meal, probably the softness of the couch. Um, <laughs> so like I, but. When it did finish, like I, I did like it, so I'm looking forward to this. I'm just not sure if I'll make it through. I don't know. You'll make it through. No, well, no, I'm gonna go see it with you guys in theater, yeah. of course. I'm gonna give the movie the respect it deserves. It's just, we'll see, we'll see. Maybe I'll load up on some sugar. Yeah, a little coffee, maybe. A little coffee. Some M and M chocolates. But I, I, I'm, I'm curious to see this uh, Austin Butler's character. He looks oh, yeah. menacing. He looks, amazing he looks like menacing. a problem. He looks like their Darth, Darth Maul. Like he looks like he's about to uh, shake things up in here. He, he's. Um, you know what he looks like? He looks like. Um, powder. A spike face. Powder uh, from the movie. Powder. Yeah. Yeah. What, yeah. What's, what's the character from the horror movie again? Oh, Hellraiser. Oh. Pinhead. The pinhead. pinhead. Not spike face. Why am I the one who he knew it? He looks like Pinhead. Pinraiser. <laughs> Pinraiser. <laughs> yeah, Austin Butler kind of looks like Pinhead. Just it's, minus it's, the pins. Uh, my question is. This guy is so white. I was like, they never let him out into the sand. Pinhead so white. Like he had like he was like, oh, actually, the guy who uh, plays the the guy I like from the first one, the big fatty. What's his name? That's his Scarsgard? dad. Yeah, yeah, Scarsgard. That's his father. Yeah, yeah. I like that character a lot. I can't wait to see what he does from the Baron Harkonnen chair. By the way, that was the big thing to me. I have always said Harkonnen. Harkonnen. And I went back and looked at one of the original things, and they s pronounced it Harkonnen. But in the new Dune, they pronounced uncle, it yeah. Harkonnen. Harkonnen. Yeah, which is, uh, which, whichever, it's all fine. To anyway, yeah. for me, other than Deadpool 3, <laughs> this is my most anticipated movie of the year. Cannot wait to see this. All right. Guys, with that down, let's move on to this, shall we? Well, we all know that uh, Daredevil, Kingpin, all that, now in the MCU, coming in in a big way. And you guys will also remember there was some debate going on uh, over the past year or two about whether or not this daredevil and this kingpin were truly the daredevil and the kingpin from the Netflix series. Now, uh, there are some people, including me, that try to explain, guys, Charlie Cox has been pretty damn clear. It's not the same daredevil from the Netflix series. He he he's made like four or five different statements about... This is going to be a different thing. This is not Daredevil season four. There's going to be differences to the character, blah, blah, blah. But nobody would hear it. A lot of people would s send me angry emails. Like, Campy, you don't know what you're talking about. This is the same Daredevil. Well, now it's official. It wasn't. But it is now. They've decided to say it. And Vincent D'Onofrio decided to kind of explain a little bit about why the change got made when it wasn't the intention before of Marvel to have this be the Kingpin and Daredevil from Netflix to making it now. Now, the folks over at CBR wrote a, a kind of a, lar a large article on it, and they go into it a little bit explaining what D'Onofrio was saying, but basically they were well into the production of Daredevil uh, Born Again, and when they viewed it and they were sitting down with Marvel executives and looking at what they had, nobody was happy apparently. And it was in that moment, D'Onofrio says, that the decision was made, you know what? We're now going to go and embrace the Netflix stuff. Uh, this comes to us from CBR, who wrote the following. Originally understood to be its own standalone universe, D'Onofrio revealed that Marvel Studios initially had no plans to integrate aspects of Netflix's Daredevil into the MCU canon, focusing solely on Kingpin and Daredevil. Then he said, during our restart of all the creative on Daredevil Born Again, all the creatives got together and said, look, this is how we've got to do it now. Talking about making it a part of the Netflix stuff. So we are for sure only speaking about it in terms of being directly connected to the original Daredevil. And that is a great thing. Something that D'Onofrio is obviously very excited about. Now, I've got some... Uh, 
fears about what could happen with them now making it the actual Netflix one, which it never was before and now it is. I've, I've got some fears about it for sure. But there is also some very big potential upside because I wasn't buying Hawaiian shirt wearing tracksuit mafia leading kingpin. I, I, echo I, here. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> but hey, he had superpowers and apparently can survive gunshots to the face. Oh, no, gunshot to the eye where the eye is perfectly fine. Yeah. Um, that's all good. Sure. Oh, they did that for me, though. They were <laughs> like, look, Chris can't deal with this. <laughs> Your Chris Carr cannot stand eye violence. <laughs> she, we got to take off the eye patch and his eye has to be perfectly sweet girl. Fine. Let's do something for her. All right. Sorry, guys. That was So, yeah, fault. like even with all of my reservations about some of the dangers of making it the same as the Netflix stuff, there are big potential benefits. Potential downside, but also some big potential benefits. And the fact that maybe now I get to forget about the founder of the tracksuit mafia. Um, You'll never forget him. I I will make myself forget it. Okay. Marvel Vincent D'Onofrio will make me forget it. I also really didn't like how they turned him into a whiny baby in Echo. I hated that. Listen, Kingpin from the Netflix series is emotional. He's very emotional. But he focuses his rage. He always lets the smart thing trump whatever else he's feeling, right? He focuses and channels and uses that rage. Not in Echo. It's like, she didn't come to meet me on my plane. I'm going to go kill everybody. Oh, fuck. I hated that. It's a nice plane. <laughs> he put a lot of work into cleaning up that plane, making it all nice for Echo. Plane for two. I, I mean, I really, really hated that because that to me was not the kingpin from the Netflix series. That being said, like it's different. You hurt Vanessa, you are fucked. You hurt Vanessa. Like, he'll channel that rage. But you didn't come and meet me at my plane. I, I got I hated that so much. But they clearly were doing this thing, and they clearly said this isn't working. It's not working. And one of the things that I appreciate sometimes is creatives that are willing to go what we decided to do and what we believed in isn't working. To change directions means you have to be big enough to say, we made a mistake. And I will always respect creatives because not all creatives have the flexibility or the luxury of having enough money and backing and budget to just go back to square one and start again. But <clears throat> even then, for them to go, you know what? We were going in the wrong direction. So instead of just keep going in the wrong direction and try to make it as salvageable as we can. Let's start again. Let's keep what we can from what we did, save some money, but let's go in a new direction. Which new direction should it be? Well, you know what, at this point, let's just make it the Netflix Daredevil. They can go back on this. Like maybe it's like, oh, I, I, I showed this side of me with the, in the Echo series. And since I got screwed over here, I'm just gonna be more ruthless from now on and not even care about anything. Again, they the could, thing about could. Kingpin is, the, it's it's not just about what he did in Echo, where the actions, like the lack of self-control and the actions of somebody who never would have become the boss. I mean, it's somebody who would have at best right, be a street okay. level street thug. I, yeah. So I, I am looking forward to moving past Hawaiian shirt Kingpin, moving past temper tantrum in his plane kingpin <laughs> and let's get back to the kingpin that we got in yeah. the daredevil series i actually want to explore that character a little more <laughs> i want to see more of that yeah. uh, anyway chris uh, you heard he's explained this it was all about the fact that this one show was not going in the right direction mm -hmm. they decided to go back to it do you like that rationale how do you think they can course correct with what they've done so far what are your thoughts on this yeah if something's not working fix it mm. simple <laughs> and and daredevil from netflix worked really well for me. I loved that show. I thought it was wonderful. Season three, I feel like they lost a few beats. I think a few things got away from them, but I loved it and I loved him in that. Now, I do think I enjoyed Echo a bit more than you guys. I liked it. Uh, okay. It was okay. I understand a lot of these uh, gripes with Kingpin. I can totally get that. I would not be all hunky-dory with somebody who shot me in the face. That would not be what I would do, but I like that we're at least getting towards that mayoral campaign. 
because I love Kingpin for mayor. Right. I love that storyline so much. So I think if we do have more of that kind of gritty, boots on the ground, almost uh, investigative journalism and legal work that we had in the Daredevil Netflix series on this show on Disney+, Plus, I think it'd be great. I really enjoyed it and I didn't want that show to end. I also stand by that as one of the best opening credit scenes uh, ever. I Which love one? the Daredevil opening credits. I think oh, yeah, it's right. so wonderful yeah, with the yeah, kind yeah. of like- Everything melts paintboard. away. Yeah, oh, it's so good, yeah. so, so good. So give me more of that. And if I get a whole bunch of Vincent D'Onofrio as that kingpin too, hell yeah. I would also like to say, now this is weird, as much as I'm saying one of the big positives of this is let's get the right, if you're gonna have kingpin, let's get the right kingpin. Like at least treat him the right way, make him act the right way. I will at the same time still say this. There were aspects of uh, Matt that I liked in Spider-Man No Way Home and in She-Hulk. She -Hulk. She yeah. Right? There were aspects of Matt that I kind of liked that were not inconsistent with the Matt that we had in the Netflix series. They just more emphasized other things about it. A little bit more lighthearted, stuff like that. Oh. And I kind of liked... To, him and she hold yeah, together. To, I, I did I really love that. Them and together. to me, what it felt <laughs> like was he's been through it, but he's grown as a person. And now he's like, you know, he can kind of crack a smile now. Mm -hmm. Like it's not, he's not just still weighed down by grief or torment. Yeah. He's come through the other side. The series, like we left off with hope, right? Yeah. We left off with him and Karen and Foggy talking about how they could fix things the right way. Yeah. They could do things uh, like all by the book, but also if they needed to, they could have Daredevil come in and do stuff. And it ended on a really positive note about mm -hmm. how he could enact change in both aspects of his life. And I think that's a really great summation of that, Jonathan. Like how... getting a new costume design. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He can, get, he yeah. can wear that your That part suit. I didn't love. That I didn't whatever. like, but but I'm just talking about him personally. And yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and, and then going back to Kingpin, if anyone uh, remembers this time, uh, I'm going to bring up Stone Cold Steve Austin, right? They, Which he you was, often do. He, he, was, he was the bad... <laughs> Everyone lo loved his character, this and that. And then there's a stint where he went to uh, uh, be friends with Vince McMahon. Remember, he was like doing oh, yeah. like, the little skits, like, you know, strumming the guitar with Kurt Angle. Yep. And then everyone, like, it was funny. And then he came back as what he was before that. And I loved it, but it wasn't as, what? I wasn't as hype what? as I was before <laughs> he did that change. Right. They might run into that problem with Kingpin. Where like if they we've seen this side of him, if they try to make him come back as the more ruthless, we still have that memory of this one. That's but nobody what, likes this version of Kingpin. I know, but still, doing, right? yeah, yeah, true. But you know what I mean because we've seen that side. Well, to follow your wrestling analogy, Undertaker became the American badass. I didn't like him and match. had no problem <laughs> coming back and being yeah, Undertaker, I guess it all right? Depends. I guess so I mean, they can do it. They can do it. Sorry, guys, we're losing everybody yeah, who yeah, has I'm no sorry. idea I'm about sorry. that era of wrestling whatsoever. Anyway, guys, question is for you. What do you think? Right move by them? How do you like the way Vincent D'Onofrio described it? Are, are you like me where it's like, please get us back to the kingpin he's supposed to be? Or, or maybe, listen, all art is subjective. Maybe you've enjoyed the kingpin we've had in this MCU iteration so far. That's totally legit too. Anyway, whatever you guys think, let us know. All right, guys. Now we're going to get to the most important part of our show, which is hearing from you guys and what you have to say, the questions you have to ask. But before we get to those we're going to take another moment and thank another sponsor of today's episode of the John Campus Show podcast, my mobile service provider, and they should be yours, Mint Mobile. Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of this video, Mint Mobile. On average, it takes about 30 days for a person to break their New Year's resolution. So if saving money was on your 2024 list, your odds aren't looking that great. Luckily, I have a 100% guaranteed way to save you money this year. Just switch to Mint Mobile. For a limited time, wireless plans from Mint Mobile are $15 a month when you purchase a three-month plan. That's unlimited talk, text, and data for $15 a month. I've told you guys many times that after switching to Mint Mobile, I am spending less than a third on my cell bill than I used to with a major carrier. Say goodbye to your overpriced wireless plans, jaw-dropping monthly bills, and unexpected overages. All Mint plans come with unlimited talk and text, plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. And don't worry about having to change phones or numbers. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and bring your phone number along with all your existing contacts. So guys, to get this new customer offer and your new three-month unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, go to mintmobile.com slash 
Campia. That's mintmobile.com slash Campia. Cut your wireless bills to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash Campia. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. And thank you to our friends at Mint Mobile for being my mobile service provider for sponsoring today's episode of the John Campia Show podcast. <laughs> All right, guys, with that down, let's get on to your questions here, shall we? Chris, what do we got up first? From Renetta W. sending in a $20 super chat. Thank I, you so much, Renetta. I loved the final episode of Reacher. Although there were some things that had me shaking my head. Like, was this a realistic moment for this particular scene? <laughs> season one was my favorite, but I still liked it. Looking forward to season three. I have not yet watched the uh, finale of Reacher, so I'm very much looking forward to it. I have loved this. I've actually preferred this season over the last season. Uh, I, I wasn't, I've always liked this season, but I was preferring season one for a while, but this, the way it's come about, I've really, really enjoyed it. Can't wait for season three and what a huge success it has been. I think they said they like tripled the numbers, the viewership numbers of what season one had good for them and good for Amazon. And yeah, man, just a big hit all around. But in terms of what she described where it's like, what, what she say exactly like, uh, just how she described that the one moment that none of us have seen, you haven't seen. Right. Is is there the is that show filled with those? Or does it sound like it's filled with those? No, the only time that I had this doesn't feel right was the end of the second to last episode, where like Reacher goes and turns himself over to the bad guys. It's like the bad guys would just go, Thanks for coming in, Reacher. Bang, 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 and drop him dead. I mean, that's what those bad guys would do. But other than that, no, the show's actually been pretty okay, good that way. Okay. You know what it is? Here's the thing. I was talking to a friend of mine. I might have said this on this show, too. The appeal of Reacher, it is not the best written show. It is not the best acted show. It is not the best directed show. Yeah, check this out. But I think part of the reason that I viscerally just really enjoy it so much is there's something very gratifying as an audience member where a big, strong, good guy just beats the living shit yeah. out of the asshole bad guy. I could get with that. Right? I know exactly like how that feels. Scene one, episode one of season two was some dude was carjacking a lady with her kid in the car and Reacher... Just so, like, that's where you open it. Okay, so snake asshole, right? So how do they open the show? Just reach your walking over and beat the living shit out of that guy. That, and there's something very satisfying about that as that's, a viewer. That's why I hope Abigail ends with all those killers beating the crap out of that little vampire. <laughs> See, I want her. They kidnapped her. Who cares? She yeah, had they powers. They kidnapped she her. Let them. They we'll, shouldn't, we'll, have, been, we'll they shouldn't have been she kidnapping little girls. This girl needs to These go. These are still people that agreed to kidnap a little girl. They, Ray is superpower. -ist. They get what they got coming like to them. Superpowers. Kill them, Abigail. Get Kill Reacher. them all. Reacher, get Abigail. <clears throat> get oh my God. All right, what's next? From Murray Reich, also sending in a $20 super chat. Thank you, Murray. Thank you, Murray. <clears throat> um... Ari intermission video. The issue mm. I have is it adds more time for me to pay a babysitter, which already isn't cheap. Mm. On top of 30 minutes of trailers, plus both A-List and Nicole Kidman's ads, you're <laughs> asking me to stay 10 to 15 minutes longer for a break. Okay, so here's the thing, Marie. I I gotta ask if you actually watched the video, because I do address that in the video. So <clears throat> for those of you who didn't see it, uh, and please do go check it out. Last night I posted an editorial video on, on intermissions and why I believe they should come back. What you're referring to, because I, I do say, in the last part of the video, I say, look, one of the drawbacks of an intermission is that it adds to the overall presentation time of a movie. Now, I don't think 10 minutes is going to be the make or break on whether or not a, a theater can add an extra screening or not. Usually the extra 35 minutes of the movie does that. But what I explained in the video, I said, there is an easy fix for that. Movie theaters. Take your 30-minute pre-show of trailers and commercials and cut it down to 20. Because your pre-show of trailers and commercials is already too fucking long. Yeah. It needs to be shortened. So shorten it down to 20 minutes and there, poof, you've made up for the 10 minutes that you have for the intermission. Um, <coughs> look, I, I simply don't think, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of when I, this is going back a number of years because we've had pre-assigned seating in movie theaters now for a number of years. But back in my early AMC days, we didn't have it in North America. 
And I would make these videos for all the reasons we should have pre-assigned seating. And all those people like just fighting it. No, that'll suck. Having pre-assigned seating would suck. What happens if you get your pre-assigned seat and there's gum in the seat? Well, then change seats. Well, what if the showing is sold out? Be the same problem. Well, you'd have the same problem if it wasn't pre-assigned seating. If you get into the theater and there's only one seat left and it's got gum in it, then you'd have the same problem. Anyway, but now everybody understands. Everybody now agrees. Oh my God, that was Neanderthalic. Yeah, it took the zoo out of the experience. Yeah, what what kind of dark ages were we living in that you had to get to a movie theater two hours early, mm -hmm. then when the doors open, run in like fucking lemmings. Go, your, oh, uh, hope I get a bring seat. Bring your mannequin doll and have to sit there to save the seat oh, for yeah, your Yeah, people would have to bring on their winter coats, even if yeah, it was summer, so they like could put their, their legs coat on a seat <laughs> so their friend who wasn't there yet. I used to hate holding seats for friends. I yeah. finally told them I wasn't going to do it anymore. There are so many advantages to having an intermission. I list them all in the video, go check them out. So I, 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 I agree, Murray, if it was just adding 10 more minutes, that's a problem. But there was an easy, easy fix for that. Shorten 10 minutes out of the pre-show time. Please tell me one of your points in that um, video, I, I will watch, is uh, so you could leave. <laughs> because you don't like the movie. <laughs> I, I did not, but yeah, if you really are hating the movie, that gives you a good out for leaving the film. All right, what's next? <laughs> from Sanchez Guy 002. Hey, John and crew, it's been a while, but do you remember Jim Henson? If so, what Jim Henson shows have you watched? Do I remember Who, who's Jim he Henson? About? Who's he talking about? It's like, do you what remember John F. Kennedy? Well, like, uh, yeah. he was before my time, but everybody Jim knows Jim Henson. Creator Jim, of the you, Muppets? Muppet of Babies Sesame Street? Someone of mentioned the Dark like, Crystal? All right, someone do you mentioned, remember, do you ever heard of John Wayne? <laughs> no. The Icon, other day, legend, the other kind day, man. someone mentioned like this, like guy Lucas jo George, George Lucas. Lucas. I don't know if you've got. Well, he does guess, indie movies. I'm like, I, what is that? that sounds <laughs> like black me, listen, and white movies. obviously, Sesame Street, The Muppet Show, and, and and all that kind of stuff. But for me, the crown jewel of the life and work of Jim Henson was The Dark Crystal. Easily for me, The Dark Crystal. Um. And I even really like that Netflix relaunch of it and why they canceled it oh, after season incredible. one. They oh, never so should have canceled it. They never should have canceled it. It won Emmys. It was wonderful. Closely was... followed by Fraggle Rock. Oh, I love Fraggle Rock. <laughs> Cast your fears second. away. Dance your cares away. What? The remake is, or the reboot, I should say, is really great of that too. I've it's never delightful. seen it. Oh my gosh, I kept it's so it. charming. It reminded me that there was a reboot. I didn't it's know. great. I mean, if now, you... but the question I have is, mm -hmm. is there a great trash heap? Yes. Does she have huge breasts? I didn't notice. I, Probably. Like, that's all I remember as a kid. Like, even as a little kid, I'm what, like, what there's the something very eyes? disproportional about <laughs> the great trash heap with these with, with her big old knockers. Massive yeah. cleavage. Oh, man. Anyway. Yeah. All what right. What's the Muppets next? love Jim Henson. Bucket list is to work with a Muppet. Um, from Joey, just pre ordered Wrestling Apple Vision Pro today. Uh, I took some money out of my education IRA for it. Worth it. Can't wait to watch the 3D movies on it. Vision Pro is a spatial computer, not really v VR. Um, no, it's really VR. Joey, I don't want to yuck your yum, but um, Dude, your education? Eh, no. I don't, I don't know. 3D um, education, baby. It's already done. Why cry about it? Yeah, I, I, I got nothing. Listen, I am an appreciator of Apple. I have an M1 MacBook on here. I've got an M1 Ultra Mac Studio in my office. M1, please. I know, I know. I got. I. I, I decided to wait till the M3 Ultra comes out. I'll, then I'll upgrade. I'm wearing an um, an Apple Watch. Even though Android is better, I have an iPhone. I am an appreciator of Apple technology. <laughs> Thirty five hundred dollars. Is it really thirty five? I thought it was twenty five. For and, and here's the thing. When you bring out a new product, you got to be able to show me something that this now lets you do something you right now can't do. Well, look, with the Apple VR, you can open your photos. I, I can open my photos right now. I can open on my phone, my computer, my watch. Why'd you go into Jimmy Stewart? <laughs> you know why I suddenly yeah. shouted? Like Jimmy uh, Stewart. I don't know about that Apple. I, like, oh, with the Apple VR, you can watch movies. I, I can watch movies lots of ways right now. With the Apple VR, you can do... I, I have yet to see anything that that machine can do that solves a problem I do not currently have. See, that's the thing with... Steve Jobs used to talk about this. 
one of the arts of creativity is to create something that solves a problem that people don't, that people can't solve right now. The Apple headset solves no problems. Now, listen, I am saying this as somebody who has not tried it yet. Now, I've tried all the other ones, right? I tried the Metaverse one. I've tried the uh, a couple of the other ones, done all that kind of stuff. So I've not tried it. Maybe once I try it, I'll go, oh, my God, I've got to leverage my financial security to buy this. Maybe I will. But I, I just I look at it from the outside. I'm like, this doesn't do anything I can't currently do. It doesn't solve any problems that I currently have. And it's ridiculously priced. So, uh, yeah. But, but listen, technology is kind of like art, right? It'll appeal to some people more than it'll appeal to others. There's nothing about this that appeals to me. But if it appeals to you, that's great. I hope he enjoys it. You you, you, you took a lot of money out to uh, get it, and uh, so you're decided. I know how that feels. <laughs> so hopefully you enjoy it. Don't regret yeah, it. Yeah, I hope you like it. All right. What's next? From Christopher Brickner, one of two. Some say it's, a, uh, it's guaranteed kids today will grow to love the Star Wars sequels like kids did for the prequels. I disagree with the guaranteed part. There are similarities, but the two are also very different trilogies. We'll have to wait and see how kids will view the sequels when they grow up. There is a misnomer in there. There are a lot. Listen, I, I come across people every week doing this show that will tell me, and th this is legit, that, you know, I got started in Star Wars with the prequels, mm -hmm. and it's what made me fall in love, mm -hmm. right? But I've also talked to a lot of people who got their start on Star Wars and the prequels and in instantly gave up on Star Wars. Oh, because the prequels are shit. I, I've, it's all subjective. If you loved it, you loved it, and I celebrate that. But I mean, with all the stories that we hear on here, it's like people say, well, I got my Star Wars, so it's me fall in love with it. I have spoken to a lot of people that's like, yeah, I'm not a Star Wars guy. Well, really, why is that? Well, you know, I watched when I was a kid. Really, you watched New Hope and Empire and Jedi Never Let It? No, 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 no. That wasn't when I was a kid, because, you know, they're in their late 20s. It, it was, uh, you know, the, the Sith ones and whatever. Oh, the prequels. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't for me. And so you can run around with this anecdotal thing and say, well, people fell in love with Star Wars because of prequels. No, also a lot of people never got into Star Wars because of the prequels too. The same can be said of the sequels. There will be people 10 years from now, 15 years from now, as hard as it is for some people today to imagine, there are going to be people 15 years from now that say the sequels were my first introduction to Star Wars and it was what made me fall in love with Star Wars. And 15 years from now, there are going to be people who say, the sequels are the first thing of Star Wars I watched, and it turned me off of Star Wars. It's the same thing with the prequels. Uh, yeah. That's why the only greatness is the original trilogy. My first Star Wars was Phantom Menace. And I liked it. So that's, that's the way it is. All right. <laughs> What's next? From TJ Perry, rejected indie game titles. The titillating triangle, the spectacular <laughs> square, the pentagon of power, for obvious reasons. Still, pentagon of power could have been, that That's, actually could have been a pretty cool one. The great circle jerk. All these places when the great circle jerk. I keep seeing that in chat. It's Tiana Jones and the circle jerk. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I said there better not be no jerking in this adventure. Because Indiana would be right in the middle. With his whip. <laughs> With his whip. <laughs> Indy. All right. Solo, what are you doing here? Your X hands are so rough. All right. Xbox exclusive. Xbox exclusive. Xbox exclusive. Oh, oh dear. Thank you for clarifying, Ray. <laughs> Sorry. All I'm right. I'm just a genius. That's what What's I'm next? From Jasmine Jones. Have you guys caught up with Percy Jackson? I've been enjoying it, and I hope it gets renewed. Do you think it will after the views it got? Oh, yeah. Like, with, with these numbers it's getting, and... <laughs> You know, I saw, I can't remember what it was, but I remember I saw what their budget on it was, and it's fairly reasonable for the type of show that they're doing. So you're getting big results, modest investment. Yeah, this thing is easily going to get renewed. No doubt about it. All right, what's next? From uh, Christopher Brickner again, the Ray Star Wars movie uh, is risk reward. If it's a great success, it helps race, uh, Ray sequels reputation. If it's bad and fails, it hurts their reputation more. Yes, but in doing any kind of risk reward, you have to evaluate what are your odds of success, right? Like preparation is all about, you can never guarantee success. I often use this poker analogy. You can get dealt pocket aces and you can go all in, but you might still lose. It's all about making decisions that put you in the best position for success. 
And my, I contend that while I love Daisy Ridley and I think there is upside to the Ray character, that going out with a Ray movie is not putting yourself or your movie in the best possible position for success. That's I don't think doing a Mandalorian movie is the perfect idea, but you are in a much better position to potentially succeed by doing a Mandalorian film than you are by doing a Ray film. And that's why, listen, filmmakers make movies that they think have a high chance of success, they think they have the right script, and it may fail. Okay, you eat it and you live with that and you move on. But I get worried when I see companies like Lucasfilm not making decisions that put them in the best possible position to potentially succeed, but rather put themselves in a position where they have to hit a miracle half-court shot in order to succeed. And that can happen too, but that's the part that worries me about it. So we'll see how it evolves. All right, what's next? From uh, Christ Courage, a $20 super chat. Thank you. For, uh, hello, John and crew. Might be a stupid question, but do more movies lose money than make money? It seems like I've seen more movies lose money. Thanks. If you want to talk about in the totality of every indie filmmaker who makes a film, yes, a massive disproportionate amount of films lose money than make money. The key is, but when you're talking about the bigger Hollywood stuff, it, it's a much closer number when you're talking about the bigger Hollywood stuff. And here's the thing. For the Hollywood studios, it becomes, we can have, say, six that make money, or let's say we can have five that make money and five that lose money. As long as the five that make money make more money than the, those other five lost us, then we're good, right? And that's a good thing. Because I never want to get to a place where studios are only making movies that are guaranteed to make money. Like, you do want to roll the dice. Again, put yourself in the best position to succeed. Absolutely. But also sometimes swing for the fences. Roll the dice. Take chances. Go into some new creative territory. And the fact that they have movies that will make them money finances those other films. And then they learn lessons from that and hopefully it helps them improve moving forward. So, Overall, yeah, I'd say nine out of every 10 movies that get made lose money. From a Hollywood studio standpoint, it's probably closer to five to five or six to four. So that's probably more of the, the realistic range. All right, what's next? From Kaiser Soze. <gasps> Woo! Uh, Elodie Young did, a, uh, did great as Electra in Daredevil, but I agree with Chris that she could be recast. Think it's because she's 42 and they'd want to go younger? Listen, I've seen her recently. She can be Electra anytime she wants. Yeah. She could totally be Electra anytime she wants. But any actor can be recast. That's yeah. just just that's just my belief. Any actor can be recast. When for me, it's not the age issue here, too. <laughs> I, I feel agree. like it's more of just the story that happened with Electra and the Foot Clan and everything, too, is just, you know, they might want to change it up for this series. And how many love interests is Matt gonna have? Yeah. Like, okay, so now it's not a triangle, it's a square. Listen, so Matt's going to get a reputation. Because he's been hooking up with Jen. Why buy the he's, cow when you can get the milk for, for free? free? Ladies, right, you know? <laughs> he's been hooking up with Karen. He's he's been, he's got, he's got Electra. Who else is he going to fall nurse. in love with? Night nurse. Yeah, he had a little. She-Hulk, so. you know. It's just, uh, yeah, it might be a bit much. Listen, I would love to see her oh, back. Oh, the hand. But... I said foot again, the hand. Shoot. <laughs> I always do it. Ninja Turtles. They can, they can recast. Um, but they might not have to. Again, I don't think the age is the issue. Now, if she was 52, 55, might be a little bit late to have her play Electra. But I, I think right now she'd still be perfectly good at it. All right, what's next? From Murray Reich. On Netflix, Daredevil went toe-to-toe -to -toe from small henchman to taking on Kingpin. And yet on <clears throat> Echo, he bounced after a short fight with Maya. What the fuck, people? Oh, well, also Maya's strong too and he bounced because he didn't need to stay there yeah yeah he, he bounced because what he was there to do was now done yeah and so he could leave so i mean that again that i had no problem i didn't like the echo series but i had no problem with that scene i thought it was a good scene to to introduce that scene did a couple of good things one it showed us the audience about her fighting prowess uh two it gave us a narrative reason to believe why Kingpin would value her so much. Because he says in that one line of dialogue, none of my guys have ever been able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him. 
and you went toe to toe. I mean, he ultimately got the better of her, but you went toe to toe with him and none of my other guys could do that. So narratively, it, it served a pretty good function. Again, I say this is somebody who didn't like the show, but I, I thought that scene kind of worked. All right, what's next? From Christopher Brickner, uh, Belichick assistant coach is the new head coach of the Patriots. Good luck, John. Hopefully he does better than most Belichick assistants do as head coach. Yeah, listen, it is one thing. You can be a great coordinator, and it doesn't necessarily mean you'll be a good coach. And Because there's been a long line. As Belichick has gone on to become the second most winningest coach in football history, six Super Bowl rings, all that kind of stuff, there have been a long line of other teams that want to snatch his assistant coaches. Patricia, other, I mean, it just, it hasn't always worked out. Some people are just great coordinators and not necessarily great at being head coaches. And Belichick has a great track record of recruiting and working with fantastic coordinators. They don't just necessarily work out to be great head coaches. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens in New England. All right, what's next? From uh, Damaris Love, Aries, the Twitter war. Oh, when he's causing fights online? Oh, yeah, I guess yeah. that's right, because he did mention that. He mentioned that's right. Oh, I didn't know what we were talking about for a second. All right, what's next? <laughs> From uh, LeVar Dove, the mayoral Fisk storyline, I believe, has so much potential to reach Winter Soldier Civil War levels of greatness. I really hope they execute it well. I know. I mean, Matt <laughs> becomes deputy mayor. It's nuts. It's nuts. It's so fun. Are you grinding your teeth right now? I'm so excited. I'm rabid about it. Oh my gosh. Have you read these comics? Re no. oh. Oh but it's but that's but you said at the end of it, right? You can have all the potential in the world. It's about execution. And it's the yeah. execution part that I've been having some questions about. So hopefully they're able to execute. All right, what's next? From uh, Christopher Brickner once more. In 2008, Bill Belichick drafted Kevin O'Connell and Jared Mayo. This means that since Bill drafted that, this means that since Bill drafted more current NFL head coaches as general manager than a thousand yard receiver. Thousand yard receivers. It's true. It's it's going to be. Listen, I really thought Belichick was going to end up in Dallas. Uh, I I don't blame Jerry Jones for keeping Mike McCarthy. Uh, the guy won 12 games for the last three years in a row. That is huge, and, and there's nothing to turn your nose up at. But I really thought Belichick was going to end up coaching the Cowboys. It's going to be interesting to see where he ends up. All right, what's next? Um, yeah, one more. <laughs> uh, from Jay Loco, want to say good luck to my Houston Texans tomorrow versus the Ravens. Get loud for C.J. Stroud. Tell you what, Stroud is a special talent, but... We've seen a lot of hot young quarterbacks. I, you know what it reminds me of, Ray? Mm. RG3. Oh, yeah. You know, the, like super hot quarterback comes in the year, but then all of a sudden in year two or year three, the league figures them out. So, But he has had a dynamic, awesome season. This run he's had with the Texans has been great. But I think they are running into a wood chipper called the Baltimore Ravens. Um, I will be way more shocked than Tampa Bay beating Philadelphia or Green Bay beating Dallas. I would be way more shocked if Houston was able to beat the Baltimore Ravens. I don't think they can. Right now, I think Baltimore's got to be considered the favorites to win the Super Bowl. So good luck to them. Hopefully they make a great game of it, but I think they're about to run into a wood chipper. But we'll see how it turns out. All right, what's next? Now our members from Jai CSC, boy, do I regret being one of those people who want movies to be longer. In my head, I thought longer movies meant deeper and richer storytelling, and I was getting my money's worth for a ticket. <clears throat> How foolish was I? Here's the thing. Deep, rich stories can be told in a short film. And, and I don't mean short 90 minutes. I mean a short film, mm -hmm. a 10-minute film. You can tell deep, meaningful, thought-provoking film if you are a skilled enough storyteller. The first five minutes of Up. Oh, my God. The first five minutes of Up. There's not even dialogue. I mean, it's just, that's the problem. Like now there are people, we've been developing and breeding an audience that, that has been mistakenly misled to believe that the only way you can have depth is by adding length. And that is just not true. The great movies of the past 70 years have proved that. Now, again, you can have a long film and have great depth and have all that too. Absolutely, 100%. Being a long film does not disqualify you from that at all. But it does not require 
a long film yeah. to be able to do that uh, two two examples the long film oppenheimer and then the short film <laughs> iss last night i mean those were th those told their stories i mean yep pretty pretty good. pretty damn well yeah. pretty damn well all right what's next from damaris love zazie beats and jack quaid are presenting the academy nominations on the 23rd of january oh good for them i'm not gonna watch it john no 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 no, no listen <laughs> <Just> kidding <laughs> because they're doing it at five fucking o'clock in the morning. Oh, come on. Oh, then I'll watch it probably. Don't we all get up early for, for, for soccer matches? Five in the morning? We'll do you that know, too. You know, I was I was talking I to a friend of mine the other day uh, about this, mm -hmm. and I 100% believe this. The Oscar nomination should be treated like the NFL draft. The NFL draft is viewed almost as much as the Super Bowl because they make an event out of it. The draft. The Academy should be making a huge event out of the nomination announcements, but they are trapped in a 1982 mindset that, well, we got to make sure we announce them before the news cycle of the day and the morning talk shows. That's 1980s thinking. In today's world, the news cycle is 24-7. Make your announcements at a 7 p.m. big grand event. Have it not just some small room with some journalists. Have it in the Peacock Theater. Have red carpets of people showing up just like they do at the draft. Have people showing up to be there when they announce the nominees for the Academy Awards and make this big ad. Instead, they're trapped in this 1980s mentality. No, we got to do it so the morning talk shows will talk about it. Okay, Grandpa. It, it's like it's not that era anymore. Make an event out of it, and this whole ridiculous notion of it being at 5 a.m. is so stupid. Yeah, Chris. <laughs> you 5 a.m. person. I mean, it's it's usually 4 a.m. <laughs> but I also go to bed at 8.30 because I'm not cool. So. <laughs> All right, what's next? From Top Gun Manny, if you can recommend one movie or show from Star Wars to someone who's never seen anything Star Wars, which would you pick? A new Hope. I, new Hope, yeah, the original. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, look, nothing's ever going to touch the original trilogy. Uh, now, I, I think Jedi is the best of the three, but really it's 1A one, one, one and 1B. I, I mean, the, I, either, it's interchangeable. I have no qualms yeah. with anybody who thinks New Hope is the best one, thinks Jedi is the best one, thinks Empire is the best one. They're just the greatest films ever made, and everything else... Even, even Listen, I love Andor. I think Andor is the greatest thing they've made since the original trilogy, but it doesn't hold nothing to the original trilogy the problem with empire strikes back is yeah it's better of the two of uh, new hoper but it wouldn't make sense to someone just jumping yeah. into empire yeah or jedi for mm -hmm. that matter right yeah. i and you know i because i was like i'm still sick but i was super dogs i was hospitalized a couple of weeks ago but during that week that i was sitting at home i decided to load up a new hope again and just watched it and even though it was the idiot special edition didn't matter god i grinned like a fool the whole way through that i just was filled with joy the whole time absolutely new hope that's the one you go to all right what's next from uh, zen quantum oh thank Those you zen quantum two. with all the chaos coming out of lucasfilm maybe there needs to be a company-wide mandalorian mandal orientation well <laughs> done oof i'll put a dollar in the jar and show myself out <laughs> No, no, no I like here. that. No, stay Mandal here. orientation yeah, is yeah, really yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah, stay here. It, the problem is, and it's not the only problem, but it starts at the top. When the top is part of the problem, no amount of Mandal orientation will save it. And again, I am not a Kathleen Kennedy hater. I'm not. Steven Spielberg, the greatest filmmaker of all time, named who he believes is the greatest producer in the history of Hollywood. And that was Kathleen Kennedy. I think Steven Spielberg's knows a little bit better than you or I do about who the greatest producer of all time would be. But being a producer, maybe even the best of all time, is not the same as being the head of a company. And while George Lucas himself handpicked Kathleen Kennedy for that role, and because she is one of the greatest producers of all time, I was all for her pick. I was all for it, 100% behind it. The reality is she has proved that this isn't the right job for her. Through organizational disarray, 
through her inability to get on the same page with their writers and directors because they have had they have had like seven times the turnover that Marvelous had at one fifth of the movies. She has shown an inability to lay out a clear long term roadmap for success. And I say all this again, I'm not a hater. I'm not trying to be mean. I think Kathleen Kennedy is a first ballot Hall of Famer for, for if there was a Hollywood Hall of Fame, she's a first ballot Hall of Famer, okay? But just because you are great at one job doesn't mean you're going to be great at another. Wayne Gretzky is the greatest professional athlete of all time. He was a little bit of a bust as a head coach. Just because he was the greatest player of all time doesn't mean he was a great head coach. One job does not equal the other. She has got to move on. I think it would be good for her. I think it would be good for Lucasfilm. And I think, honestly, until Kathleen Kennedy moves on, I don't think Lucasfilm will ever get to the point that it can truly realize its potential. So, that, anyway, that's that's my soapbox on that. All right, what's next? <laughs> From uh, Jared Vester. Hey, John, broke my ankle in oh, three that sucks. places. Oh, had surgery. Otherwise, they said I'd be permanently disabled. Mm. Watching your show has kept my mind off of everything going on, and I appreciate all the hard work you do to give us that kind of content where we can forget about what's going on around us and just enjoy talking about movies. Oh, dude, Jared, I hope you're on the mend. Yeah, well, well, thankfully, they did the surgery. Yeah. I mean, thank Listen, I dude, I up. sprained my ankle once and I, I wanted to cry for a day. Messing lower back joints, okay? Jo back and joints, man, never fun. Never fun. But ankles, man, that, that can be a particular... Ugh. So happy recovery to you. May it be speedy and thorough. Thankfully, you got the surgery. So uh, hopefully you're up and literally up and running again uh, very soon. And guys, with that... That'll do it for today's installment of the John Campy Show podcast. Thank you so much for being here and making this show part of your day. Big special thank you to all you guys who sent in questions, number one, because it gave us great fun things to talk about, but number two, you supported this channel as you did it, and all of us involved with the show, thank you guys so very much for your support. Don't forget to come on back and join us again on Monday. We'll look forward to seeing you then. Until then, I want to thank the people in the room with me, Ray Ora. Have a good weekend. Jonathan Voico. Oh, I love that. Jonathan Voico. See you guys. Chris Carr. Bye. My name's John Campia, and until next time, my friends, bye-bye.